Good morning. Welcome to Seymour Congregational Church, where no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you're welcome here. It's so nice to see uh, the choir out here. I'm used to having you behind me, and it's nice to see your beautiful faces this morning. It's really nice to see everyone's face. I missed you all last week while I was away, and I want to say thank you to Glenn and to everybody else for holding down the fort. Your sermon was beautiful. I, I tuned in, and thank you very much for the text message of Loving Louder that you sent to me. I was uh, somewhere on the road in uh, Arizona at the time when that came through. Um, this morning, uh, after worship, uh, gentlemen, you're invited to join me in the community room, which is formerly known as the gym, for coffee hour. Uh, So I hope that you'll uh, get yourself a little snack and join me in there for some conversation with the pastor. And um, I think that's all my message. Oh, I want to just say thank you for everyone who helped out with um, the refrigerator situation. I have not checked any of my emails since I left, so but I did hear there was a situation with the refrigerator, and thank you, thank you, thank you for taking care of that. If I have not replied to your email, I will be going through those today, and uh, we'll follow up with you as soon as possible. So if you wouldn't mind rising for our opening hymn, it's number 226. <laughs>
morning. Please join me responsibly for the call to worship. Peace be with you. And also with you. Behold, Jesus stood among his disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. May the peace of Christ dwell in our hearts. But they were startled and frightened and thought they had saw a spirit. Lord, calm our fears and fill us with your presence. Jesus said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Help us, O oh God, to trust in your promises and believe in your resurrection power. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. May the Spirit enlighten our hearts as we gather to worship. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Empower us, O Lord, to be witnesses of your love and grace to the ends of the earth. Let us worship the risen Christ with joy and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Amen. Join me in unison for the invocation. Gracious God, as we gather in your presence today, we invite your spirit to dwell among us. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word, and guide us as we seek to follow in the footsteps of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Testament scripture for this morning is from Psalms uh, chapter 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will your love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it, in, ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. Psst. You ready? Were you listening? Come on. <laughs> Brittany, you want to come up? Okay. Good morning. Were you listening? Were you listening? I was listening. <laughs> I want to know about your favorite animal. What's your favorite animal? Cat. What are cats good at? Climbing. Climbing. Excellent. What are your favorite animals? Dogs. Dogs. Why? What are they good at? Cuddles. They're good cuddlers. Yes, there are some animals we should not cuddle with. What animal shouldn't we cuddle with? A fox. A fox. Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. Other favorite animals? Horses. What are horses good at? What are... Taking you places, excellent. What else? 
Dolphins. What are dolphins good at? Swimming. Swimming. Birds. Birds. What are b- birds good at? Flying. Flying. Anybody else? Giraffes. What are oh. giraffes good at? Yes, eating things that are up high. Excellent. So God has created all of these great animals, and they all have very uh, different things that they're good at, that they were built to do. I want to talk to you about a kangaroo, though. My cousin lives in Australia, and her favorite animals are kangaroos. What are kangaroos good at? Jumping. They're super fast. Do you know what else they're good at? They're good at boxing, yes. <laughs> they are actually really good listeners. Why do you think they're really good listeners? Yeah, so they can listen, they can hop away, but they have really big ears, actually. They have really big ears on the top of their heads. What other animals have really big ears? What other animals are really good listeners, do you think? Elephants. Ooh, elephants might be really good listeners with those big ears. Anybody else that you know have really big ears? No? Ooh, tigers are probably really good listeners too, right? Big cats. So I want us to see if they have good ears as well. So, Ava. If you were in trouble, what would you yell? If you were in trouble. Not trouble like blah, blah, blah. But trouble like, oh no, I need help. Help. Right? If we were in trouble, we would yell help. So can you yell help really, really loud for me? Help. Perfect. (laughs) Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. Okay, now Ava, I want you to whisper help. Did anybody hear that? Oh, we got a couple people up front, maybe a couple people in the choir. Okay, now Ava, I want you to think help. Did anybody hear that? No. No. Huh. They heard you when you yelled it. They didn't hear you when you whispered it, and they really didn't hear you when you thought it. So, There's this verse in the scripture we just read, okay? The Lord hears when I call to him. So, does God hear your big voice? Yes. Yes. Does God hear your whisper? Yes. Yes. And does God hear what's in our thoughts? Yes. Yes. So no matter how loud we are, right? No no matter how much we might yell for help, or whisper for help, or think about the help that we need, God hears us. And that's what our verse this morning from Psalms was all about. It was about when we need help, God is there to call to. So you may raise your hand at the end of service and ask for prayers, or you may say it quietly in your head. But no matter what we do, God is always listening. And that's very important for us to remember. Are you ready to go to Sunday school? Okay. Will you pray with me first, though? Thank you. Dear God, we thank you for listening. For listening when we have troubles and problems. And for listening for when we praise you and we have joys. Help us. Help us to be loud so that we can spread your word to others and they may know that you are always listening. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Have fun. I couldn't help but think about help as Ashley was talking 
and how hard it is to ask for help and how the simple word, those four letters, H-E-L-P, in and of itself is a prayer. So I hope that you remember that any time that you need it, that you could just help, ask for help. And the way that God works is you can actually think it, and you can also whisper it, and you can also say it out loud. And it's in saying and asking for help out loud that your vulnerability and true self is able to uh, be set free when you allow others to be there for you. So um, it's one of the hardest things that we do in life is asking for help. So this morning's gospel reading um, comes from Luke. And we'll be talking about when Jesus appears to his disciples after the resurrection. And um, since I wasn't here last week, and the weeks after Easter are some of my favorite parts of the, of the Christian year, what I decided to do is that I'm actually going to read from this whole uh, beginning part of the chapter uh, 24 from, from Luke, because I think that in doing that, it will bring uh, today's reading into uh, context for you. And before I begin reading, um, there's a piece of information that I want to share with you that has been swept under the rug. And every year around this time, it's swept under the rug again, even though this is the only time of the year where we really talk about Mary Magdalene. And for those of you who have participated in the Mary Magdalene book study um, and had some of the conversations about this, you're very well aware of how uh, in church we don't really give her her due diligence in our conversations. So um, I believe it, re it bears repeating over and over and over that Mary Magdalene was, in fact, the first person to discover that Jesus was not in the tomb. And not only that, she was actually the first person to believe that Jesus was resurrected. And Mary Magdalene was the first person to tell anybody else about it. And that is why we call her the Apostle to the Apostles. One of the reasons why I stress this to you um, is because as a woman who is a minister, I think that it's really, really important for us to value and recognize um, the women who are in the Bible. Uh, as you know, many, many years, women weren't allowed to stand here in the pulpit and to uh, speak like this. And um, it's important for uh, us to show other young women uh, that this is something that is doable. So um, it's important that, you know, after 2,000 years of women being pushed into the background, into the back of the story, um, that we really start to pay attention and recognize Mary Magdalene as one of Jesus's closest and most beloved disciples. And it's likely that she was able to share and learn some of the most powerful and deepest um, wisdom that Jesus had to offer. Um, because if you remember, the male disciples often had a tendency to argue with Jesus um, or act a little bit rebellious when he was teaching any lessons that were outside of their comfort zone. The other reason why I wanted to start from the beginning of this chapter is to help you see that getting this resurrection information news out really took quite a bit of work. Um, as you might imagine, when somebody comes back from the dead, it's very frightening. And um, in a minute, 
we're going to hear about how Peter, after he looked into the tomb and saw that Jesus wasn't there, he ran home and probably went and hid under the bed because it was quite scary. I would be scared too. Um, So anyway, we're going to start from Luke uh, chapter 24 with verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were there, perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the son of man must be handed over to the sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning home from the tomb, they told all the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had had happened. So as you might imagine, this whole resurrection thing was not very believable. And it took a lot of convincing to get anyone to believe that it was true. In the next part of this chapter, Jesus appears on the walk to Emmaus. And the disciples don't have any clue at that time that they're walking with Jesus. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall inside of Jesus' brain as he walked alongside of them and listen to the disciples' rambling tales of Jerusalem. I bet he couldn't help but laugh to himself as he listened to their earnest and befuddled recount. And I'm sure he just shook his head and thought to himself, these guys are just like a lost sheep in a haystack. And before dinner... I bet Jesus reviewed his parable playbook so he could serve up some spiritual wisdom and nourishment as they ate. Because amidst the clattering of the plates and animated conversation, we're going to hear that Jesus was finally able to guide their hearts toward deeper uh, comprehension of what had happened. And this is how the account goes from Luke. Now on the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, 
and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is nearly now over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was was at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been known, made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And now finally, today's gospel reading. It's so a part of the chapter that is scheduled for today in the lectionary. And it's a part of the uh, Bible that I, I like to call the peace be with you chapter. Because knowing the fear that the disciples have about seeing a ghost, uh, he attempts to, Jesus attempts to calm their nerves by telling, him, telling them that he comes in peace. I mean... It's the least he can do if he's showing up there after he's died. And Jesus wants them to know, it's okay. Don't be afraid. Peace be with you. It's Jesus' way of showing compassion and love preemptively, offering the peace. And Jesus knows what has happened is unbelievable, and he understands that it's scary. So he's tenderly trying to keep them from being scared, just so that he can finally prove who he is. And we're going to see here that the way that Jesus is, uh, proves who he is, he, he shows the disciples his scars. We all have scars, don't we? We have physical scars. We have emotional scars. In fact, it's in telling the stories of our scars that we often begin to 
love and understand one another and ourselves even better. I have a misplaced dimple up here on my face, but you can only see it when I smile. It comes from a time when I was dancing around the TV room when I was a little girl for my grandmother. And I was spinning and spinning and spinning in circles until I became so dizzy. I fell and I hit my face on a stool that was in the room. I had to be taken to the hospital for stitches. It's nothing in comparison to the scars that others have because it's really only given me this unique dimple that I wasn't born with. But others have bigger scars, like Jesus's, that have been life-changing. Many of us have those kinds of scars, and they become like resurrection scars. My brother Walt has a scar like that. As you know, this last week and, week and a half, I was away in Arizona visiting him. And we don't get to see each other very much because he has a very difficult time traveling because he became a quadriplegic 22 years ago. But the interesting thing about him is that there was no event that occurred that set this into motion. Just one day, he was out and about, and he started to notice some tingling in his legs. And then as time went on, he started to notice he was having a hard time using the stairs. And next he noticed that as he was walking, he was stumbling. So he eventually made his way to the doctor, and they thought he had MS. So they put him in an MRI to determine and confirm that diagnosis. But when he got into the MRI, they found that his neck had been seriously injured in several places. It was a miracle that they ever even found that there was this injury because they were looking for something up here and the MRI cut off somewhere in here. So the doctor sent him home and said, come back in a week. And the night before his next doctor appointment, he stumbled again and he landed on the sofa. And that's when um, this all began. That was it. Later that day, they did surgery, taking some bone from his hip, and they repaired his neck. And when he woke up, he was not able to move from his neck down. So when I tell you that 10 years ago when I visited him in Arizona, and I tell you that I rode in a sidecar of my brother's motorcycle, it sounds quite astounding, because this was after the injury. And yet it's true. And when I tell you that while I was away in Arizona, my brother did all of the driving. He would not let me get behind the steering wheel once. He drove everywhere. You might think to yourself, she's got to be lying. But I'm not. In fact, it is nothing short of a miracle. Because in the beginning, he couldn't even feed himself. And after doing months and months and months of physical therapy, he still couldn't pick up a dime from the table. But the thing about my brother is that nothing is ever going to get in his way of doing the things that he really, really wants to do. Whether that means getting on the road to visit the national parks, do some work in his workshop, or even if it means cracking a beer. So while I was out there talking with him, I asked him about it, knowing that I was going to be giving a sermon today on resurrection. 
And in many ways, his story is nothing short of a resurrection. In fact, he says that he has had two lives. He, he calls them B.C. for before crash and A.D. for after doctors. I think that this is relatable to many of us, even if we have not had such a profound injury. We all have our own resurrection stories. We have the lives we live before an event takes place, the ones that change us in some kind of a fundamental way, and then we have our new life, our resurrected life. Parts of ourselves we've let go, parts of us that have come into our new life and stay with us. My brother and I talked quite a bit about that, too, and how much life has changed for him, A.D. One of the things that may seem obvious uh, is that he can't feel most of his body, and it makes it very hard for him to get around. He's a partial quadriplegic, which means he's, uh, imagine like a, dol uh, a Dalmatian with spots and all the black spots are spots in his body that he can't feel. So he's a partial quadriplegic. So one of the obvious things that he needs is a cane. So when you see him coming around, you can tell that he has a disability because he uses an arm cane. And it's pretty obvious when he goes into the store when people see him. Um, so those things have changed about him. Those are real obvious things. But the unfolding of these events have created an even bigger change, a change that you may not see, and that's on the inside, inside of his heart. And some of those changes have resulted in a relationship between the two of us that is better than it could have ever been. He shared with me that if it were not for the accident that he had, that he and my dad may have never had the close relationship that they did before my dad passed. And he's been nothing but short, nothing short of a, a wise and uh, true teacher to my daughter, Julia, teaching her perseverance and resilience since she was in the car accident two years ago. But even more than that, these events, they've touched him in a way that other life events may not. Because they've forced him into becoming patient. Becoming patient with himself and becoming patient with others. He's learned to appreciate the small things in life, like watching the wildlife from his front porch. And he shared with me that this has been the ultimate test of forgiveness. He's learned to forgive others for not understanding his needs. For example, he noted that oftentimes people like to hold the door for him when he's coming and they mean well, but what they don't know is that he's already planned ahead the things that he needs to get from point A to point B. And when someone holds the door for him, it may actually make him stumble because the door's not where he's expecting it to be. And he knows how helpful they're trying to be. But the biggest act of forgiveness he shared comes from forgiving himself. You might wonder, why might someone feel like they need to forgive themselves for an injury that they might have? But he shared that he has racked his brain over and over trying to figure out if there was ever anything he could do differently to keep from becoming injured. And yet, he's had to come uh, to a place of forgiveness because of this. 
So as I read this morning's final uh, part of this chapter, I thought it was important to share this story of Walter with you because it demonstrates personal resurrection and it relates to the physical and the emotional uh, changes that can happen and contributes more importantly to our inner transformation and the miracle that can come from our wounds. And it's a reminder for all of us that in order to come to a place of acceptance and to receive the blessings that come from resurrection, we need to find a place of peace within ourselves, a place that surpasses fear, the place where peace passes understanding. This is Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in his presence, in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me is the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Amen. So as we gather in your name, we lift up those in need, knowing that you hear our prayers, Lord. Bless our giving, O Lord, that it may be a reflection of your boundless love and compassion. May our offerings bring light to the darkness, corners, and hope to the weary hearts. Guide us in our generosity, that through our actions your kingdom may be made known on earth.
That's my fault, I apologize. Muted myself. Please join me for the prayer of dedication of gifts and self. Gracious God, as we offer these gifts to you, we remember the word of Psalm 4. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. May these offerings reflect our trust in you, and may they be used to further your kingdom on earth. Bless them, multiply them, and guide their use for the glory of your name and the advancement of your purposes. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and merciful God, in this sacred moment of prayer, we lift our hearts to you, acknowledging your presence among us as we reflect on the encounter of the disciples with the risen Christ. We pray for the world, torn by strife and division. Bring healing and reconciliation to countries that are at war. And please, God, guide leaders towards paths of peace and understanding. This morning, we lift up those who are in need, especially the vulnerable and marginalized, Grant them strength and courage, and may they find solace in your loving embrace. Bless our communities, that they may be havens of compassion and support for all who dwell within them. We pray for those who are sick and dying, that they may find comfort in your presence and be surrounded by your peace. Grant them healing according to your will, and may they know the depth of your love in their time of need. Amidst the challenges and struggles of life, we also celebrate the gift of life itself. We give thanks for the moments of joy and beauty that surround us, and for the blessings of love and friendship that enrich our lives. We pray that our prayers rise like incense before you, O oh God, and may they be a source of strength and hope for all who are in need. We ask these things, God, using the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
As you leave this place, carry with you the light of love and the warmth of compassion. Let your actions speak volumes of the graces we've received. And may your lives be testaments to the power of faith in action. Go forth with courage, knowing that you are called to be instruments of peace and vessels of of hope in a world that longs for healing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. and the peace of God be with you this day. Go in peace and the peace of God.